About 30% um, of you sitting here today are women. Have a look around. Just take a moment now to look around. Interesting, isn't it? <laughs> Where I don't profess to be um, an expert in equality or rights for women, I am a woman and I work in a sometimes male-dominated industry. My name is Sarah Sherman. I'm the service manager for the Bloomsbury Learning Environment. It's a shared e-learning service for five of the colleges of the University of London. At least once a term, I attend a meeting at the university at which I'm usually the only woman in attendance. And the imbalance really concerns me, not because I feel intimidating <coughs> speaking in front of a, a group of men, but it's just not representative of the gender makeup of the world we live in. So why are we talking about this today? This being a fortnight where the social media networks whirred into a frenzy when actress Emma Thompson's rousing speech promoting a new UN gender equality movement happened. Um, Frank, wherever he is, over there, and the FITI organisers have over the years, when organising this conference, made really concerted efforts to get women presenting. And it's proved really challenging. Where are the women? Tweeted a lot of people in FITI 2012 and 13. Where indeed? Well, I have three of them here with me today. Sam, who you've just heard from. Mandy, who's the head of corporate business change initiatives at Liverpool John Moores. And Heidi, who's the IT services and deputy director of information at York. During this session, we're going to be, um, I'm going to be inviting our panelists to share personal experiences, and we're going to discuss and explore the issues around women in technology and in IT, and in particular in leadership roles. I'm going to then open up the session uh, to include contributions, comments, suggestions from the audience. Um, and the aim of this session is really to get you all thinking about your own workplace. Regardless of your gender, I want you to think about how you can be better aware and maybe even potentially what you can do to help address this gap. So first, I'm going to hand over to Heidi and ask you to just introduce ourselves, if you could just tell us a bit about your professional journey. Oh, Lord, I'm... I don't think you wanted me to talk about that at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm Heidi fraser Kraus, and I'm currently Head of IT Services at the University of York and Deputy Director of Information, which means I have a role in overseeing the archives and the library. In terms of my professional journey, I have to be honest and say I absolutely fell into IT. I was not given a ZX Spectrum when I was five. Um, to be honest with you, technology per se doesn't really interest me at all. Please don't tweet that in case my <laughs> boss is looking. Um, it's what you can do with technology that interests me. Um, in terms of the gender piece, when Frank asked me to do this, I was actually quite reticent about it. Um, I thought, I've never really bothered with that sort of women thing. Um, I haven't gone along to uh, women-only support events or anything like that. And that made me think, why had I not done that? And maybe I'm going to give it all away now, but I suppose my first thought was that I've never actually thought of my gender as being an issue or a difference at all. And I don't want other people to think of that either. So I'll start with that and let other people. Thank you, Heidi. Mandy. Um, yeah, my name's Mandy Phillips. I'm, I've got the longest job title in the world, working for Liverpool John Moores University. I've got it written down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do forget it now and again. Um, and I suppose my journey into the technology was, uh, was when I was about 26, because I didn't do anything in terms of technology at school. I dropped out of A-levels and spent 10 years being a pizza maker and a taxi driver and all different types of things. And at 26, I picked up a college prospectus, flicked through it and thought, what will earn me the most money? I'll do a course in IT. So I took myself back to college and went and got a degree and ended up working in the university library of the, of the university I was studying at. And here I am in education, in technology, which doesn't earn me as much money as I'd hoped when I opened that brochure. But I think I've had quite an interesting path because I started on a... Um, a an IT support desk helping students. I then moved into a, a role in a teaching and learning development unit supporting WebCT. But that was quite interesting in itself because that role came up um, and they were asking for a, um, a WebCT technician. And I looked at the job description and decided against applying for it because I didn't want to be a technician. I didn't want to crawl around under tables and do 
infra infrastructure hardware type stuff. And nobody um, got the job. And I was approached by the manager who said, we thought you'd be really interested in this. And I said, well, what, what is the job doing? And what he said the job was doing was completely different to what the job description said it was doing. So he rewrote the job description and I applied for it. And from that point on, I've snaked my way through, through different parts. Okay, thank you. And Sam, you've done your introduction, yeah. so we'll, we'll carry on. So we've, I asked Frank to leave these slides up, which were the ones that um, Sam pulled off during her presentation for us. So there's obviously there's a problem here, um, particularly in, in leadership roles. And I'm going to invite my panelists here to talk about well, what's, what is this about? Why are we seeing these low numbers of women being leadership positions? Anyone want to kick okay. off? Okay, so again, when I thought about this, I did a little bit of research and thought, well, in higher education, there isn't a problem with women in IT at all. Um, so I went to USISA, who are the uh, body that all IT people belong to in universities, and asked them for um, a list of names or a gender breakdown of who was head of IT. And what I found really surprised me, it said that there was only about 18% of women were IT directors in the higher education sector, which fits pretty well with the statistics um, behind us here. And so I, just, I did a little survey of those women and asked them a number of questions about um, what they thought, why there was an issue. So I was particularly focusing on women in leadership and what they thought the issues were. And what came out of that was really quite interesting, and it's around this social stereotype. So as, as Mandy was saying, the idea that you can have somebody who's in IT, technical thing, being a woman, seems to be, for some people, a very difficult stretch. <coughs> a number of people said that they'd come across the stereotype of, you can't do this, you can't be an IT director. IT directors are very technical people. Um, only men can do that. And I was very, I was really shocked by that because the people that are interviewing um, IT directors will be very senior people in our institutions <laughs> and that this bias is there um, really got me. I then reflected what I had done to support women um, in IT. I've done nothing, <laughs> if I'm absolutely honest. Again, because I don't try and discriminate between men and women. So I can't say that I have put in place in my organization any particular policies or made any changes around um, selecting women, preferentially over men, and I know that's illegal anyway, but if you had two equal candidates, you could <coughs> decide on the, on the side of women. And I suppose that's exactly what we're being asked to do here, is reflect on what we actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. What, what we need to do differently, think differently, act differently to change that balance. Um, because I've managed to achieve a position of leadership. Um, so it must be possible, I suppose that's the first thing to say. But I'm not doing anything to help um, other colleagues, female colleagues. And I suppose the question I would put out to the audience is, should I, should we do anything different? What, what needs to change if you want to redress that balance? Is there anything that we can do, do you think, in the positions that you're in? Well, I th can I just add a little to that? Because you have done something. Because when I came to you for <laughs> advice once, you very kindly gave me a day of your time. Oh, so right, okay. so you've, you've acted in a mentor in some way to, okay. to other women in, in technology. Um, I, think, I think it's really interesting. I think the same at my organisation. I don't feel empowered to be able to do anything within the organisation. Mm -hmm. So what I did in Liverpool a couple of years back, because I was really fed up, A, with IT as a, as a, a brand, if you like, um, was set up a little organisation, if you call it, called Widget, which was women in digital and IT. And I really wanted that to be anybody who did anything with technology. You didn't have to work in an IT department. Um, you didn't have to, you know, it was the, it was, if you like using an iPad, you could come along to this forum with other people, with other women who liked to be involved with technology. And it was really interesting because we got digital artists and, and, and producers and all kinds of people because technology now crosses every sector. It's not just about the infrastructure and the network of an organization. It's in everything that we do. So. Part of me thinks, it, you know, women in technology it isn't just about the IT department, it's that whole, it's the business. Mm. And there was a, a TEDx um, speech the other day, which I tweeted a link about, 
um, where a, a woman was talking about this issue and she was saying we as women we get advised to do two things in terms of our professional development we get advised to work on ourselves so do we go on assertiveness training courses and and things that will help our own personal skills and we get advised to work on our team so we build you know team building and motivational <coughs> exercises for them and what she feels the issue is is that men mentor men about business so about business acumen about financial acumen and that's she feels is the missing link for women because to get to a senior position yes you have to have the soft skills yes you have to look after the team but you have to know what's right for the business and how you're strategically aligning yourself to that business and that, that really made me think about how how we do that in our organization mm. yeah so we've got um we have a, a group called wise in our office um which so is got a widget and a wise yes <laughs> Um, it's, some offices have their own kind of group that's for that office. I'm part of the virtual team. We don't have one in my site. Uh, each, each one has to have an executive sponsor. And our executive took a different stance. Um, he's a guy. And he really believes that WISE shouldn't need to exist. Um, and I think he's right. Yeah, I agree. I really do. Um, I go to some of the events. Some of them are a bit, um, bit burn the bra. Some of them are actually really useful, but the assertiveness stuff you talked about, the networking, that's been really valuable, I think, for people. Yeah. Um, and we do get the odd article that people send around that, that's pretty good. Um, but back to what you said about mentoring. Our organisation is huge on mentoring. Um, and I've had two mentors. Uh, one was a lady. And it, it went really well up until she, she offered me a job. It's very nice, and I didn't take it, and then she stopped men mentoring me. <laughs> um, um, and my current mentor's guy, he's our, one of our chief technology officers. Mm. Um, and, but, you know, both have been good experiences, but I think that's something that can really help for, for guys and girls. Are you a mentor for somebody? Yourself? No, but I've helped find some. Yeah. Um, but I don't do it myself at the moment. I kind of feel the mm. same um, as Sam and Heidi, mm. that when, when it's been offered, the soft development guys send around the springboard and the staff development trainings for women. I just think there's something about it makes me feel it's a bit condescending. It's like, as a woman, you have to go to a special women's only club or group. Actually, and then what about the other people, the, the men, the, the non-women, who also would like to get ahead and progress up the career ladder? What, you know, does, do we have to have a men's only group? Why can't we just, you know, support everybody's needs? But, but in the same time, you know, your, your grouping obviously is, is different and it's for, for anybody interested in anything tech. So, for me well, personally, I would, oops, sorry, I would choose not to go to it, but... Well, and, and to be honest, the, the men of Liverpool did kick up a stink yeah. and asked for a midget group to have <laughs> alongside the widget group. And so, and we could come together at certain points and do things together. So, yes, I did take a bit of flack for that. Um, there's one other thing I've been thinking about since I've been doing a bit of reading, and I, I got the same stats from you, Sizer, as well, and we've been talking a lot about women in IT leadership roles. Um, I also contacted the Heads of E-Learning Forum to find out what, what their split was, because they're in similarly senior roles. And actually, it's a lot better, girls. It's 40% uh, of membership of health are uh, female. And also, I contacted the Association for Learning Technology, and Maren is around. Maren's the chief exec, and she's a lady. Um, and I contacted her to find out what, what it's a membership organization, what, what the split was. Um, and it's roughly 45% women, 55% um, men. So that's interesting. That makes me feel someone who works in e-learning and, and tell, but maybe women are, are getting, it's easier to get those roles or to, to work up the, the ladder than in IT. Is, is that fair? And is well, that I'd like to ask the audience. Mm. You're all employers. What do you look for when you're employing somebody? Do you, do you worry about their gender? Nope. So there's ladies at the front, everybody shaking their heads. So why is there the difference? Mm. Why is there only 18% of women in leadership there, positions? Yeah. Sam, um, we got mics around you. Uh, James Clay from Activate Learning. Um, what I've always found surprising when I've employed people, I've employed them for their skills, but the number of people, including women and men, who've come up to me afterwards and said, I'm really surprised you employed a 55-year-old woman. I'm really surprised you employed a 60-year-old woman. I'm really surprised you employed an Asian woman. As though it should be something different or something special, or I'm going out of my way. No, what I've done is I've picked the right people for the right job who've got the right skills to enable my team to make a difference. But it is, unfortunately, I don't, 
you know, it's just one of the, there's a good tweet out there that's talking about this isn't just a problem in tech, this no. is a problem in society. Yes. Yes. And yes. We have made a difference in the last 30 years, but we've still got a long way to go in order to get and bridge those gaps which mm. are across the whole of society. <coughs> so, so can I ask then, if we're all doing that, why is there such a big difference? No, we're not all doing it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, the experience has shown, you know, when we, one of the reasons I remember when we talked about where are the women on panels, and I've been part of conference committees, and what was really interesting was when you ask men who should speak at a conference, they generally choose men. But when you ask women who should speak at a conference, and this is a generalisation, I hasten to add, it does not apply to all individuals, and your bond mileage may vary. Um, <laughs> but gem, what, it's a bit of a generalisation, but when women are asked who should speak at conferences, generally they pick men as well yeah. in terms of doing it. And there is, that's not saying that's a good or a bad thing, it's just saying that's it's just one of the things that just seems to have happened. So it's about this social stereotyping in a way. Absolutely. I, th I think yeah. it's a society thing. It's built into... Um, the kind of societies that we live in. It's a patriarchal stereotype. So what was your phrase? You patriarchal stereotype. stereotype. Is, it, is it also, though, because I, I agree with you completely, is the right person for that job, it doesn't matter, you know, who they are or where they come from, but is it about that pool of candidates that apply for that job? And therefore, is it about how we give people the confidence, not, not just women, yeah. but men and women, to stretch themselves and to push themselves yeah. and to, you know, to put their head above the parapet and go for things that they might not normally have gone for. Do you know what I mean? I, I contacted yeah. an HR manager at one of the five institutions I work for and I asked him about um, applicants to IT jobs and he said, since July 2016, um, they've had four posts and the number of applicants male were 21 um, for female applicants. So it's, it's somewhere before the um, recruitment, um, uh, giving someone a job, it, it's where are the women applying for jobs? There was something in the, the book that I mentioned earlier, get the book, um, <laughs> that was saying about uh, when people, you know, men and women see a, a role, a leadership role, especially advertised, <laughs> if men can tick sort of 70% of the boxes, they'll have a go. Mm. Yeah. So they can bullshit better. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wow. I, mean, I think it was worse than that, I think it was 50%. Yeah. 50%. And for women, it had to be sort of around the 80% mark before yeah. they'd have a go. Yeah. And, it, you know, there's a confidence thing there. Yeah. Well, I think mm. someone Sorry. once mm. said to me that you should never apply for a job that you can completely do because there's no point and you won't learn anything from it. So you kind of, there's got to be a bit of, you know, yeah. black. We've got a question over there from the audience. I shall tell you a little bit of my anecdote, which, of course, does not constitute statistics. But of the... Um, of the the three people I know who made CTO before they were 30, only one of them is a woman. And of the, um, of the kind of people who I've worked with in senior engineering management positions, only around 25 or 30% of them are women. And I, I think there's at least two problems here. One is that all of those people, whether they're men or women, had to really fight for that position. And a lot of them made up the mind they wanted to do that, probably before they were teenagers. So how do we... How do we kind of, or, or, firstly, what is the problem there where women decide not to do that? And secondly, how do we fix that? And, and the second problem, which has, I've been discussing with a few friends recently, is, is about punitively technical interview processes because a lot of these things tend to be absolutely fantastic at getting people who are good, but they tend to all have the, um, all have the quality that they recruit culturally and diversely, diversely for what the company already has, which tends to be white men. Yeah. And that was, can I just say, that was one of the comments from the survey I did of the ITHE women, that they said at interviews often they'd been asked extremely technical questions for a, a very senior leadership role, and of course you need to know something about tech, but the job is much more yeah. than that, and it was more from the comfort zone of the people who were doing the interview. Yeah. Absolutely. And I'd like to add, uh, I've, I've got two jobs out currently, or in the next week or so, for, for .NET developers. And when the recruiter said to me, what's the most important skill set for this? I said, it's communication, because I can teach them to program. You can't so, teach them to talk. No, and, it's, and it's a, it really is about that mindset of not approaching it from, you know, I don't want a code monkey who's going to sit in the corner and not talk to anybody. I want somebody who can come in, converse with the business, and deliver some solutions. Which the researchers, the communication things, the researchers would say that is a stereotypical female, female, female <laughs> attribute or 
patriarchally, <laughs> so stereotypically. <laughs> anyway, let's not worry about it. We're all politically correct in here. Um, I think we had some questions yeah. down at the front. Sue. So, Hi, um, Sue White from the University of Southampton. Um, like many universities, the University of Southampton's got an Athena Swan agenda. And when my particular department uh, uh, applied for um, uh, the, the, the charter, um, we undertook to um, try to re um, ensure that women, we actively s approached women to apply for jobs. Observationally, that doesn't seem to be happening, and I suspect that it's a lot more effort than people can be bleep, bleep, bleep bothered to do. Um, and I tweeted a little bit earlier, the information um, folk in the EU have produced um, a book about how to, you know, they researched and produced a book about how to get more women um, in tech, and I'd be interested in your view on this. And they, one of their recommendations, which I think is incredibly powerful, is that to in, put in place a rule, and you have to listen to the very end of this, because usually people throw their hands up, to put in place a rule that when you shortlist, you always shortlist an equal number of men and women. You only ever appoint the best candidate, but you provide, you shortlist people on the potential that you, th you thought that they had the potential at some time to fulfill that role. And your job then is directly to provide them with the feedback to enable them to su possibly successfully or certainly confidently apply for similar roles in the future. Sorry, and can I just say that that's fine if you have women applying? Yes. Yes. Well, that, that, <laughs> then it ties back to the, the statement that we made um, but I don't think that we're actually executing no. effectively because I think culturally yeah. there's a lot of um, implicit bias. Yeah. Um, and BCS is, I'm an uh, implicit bias ba ambassador, trained ambassador for the BCS now. And Harvard have also got an implicit bias um, test, which I would say everybody, go and Google it, find it, I'll tweet the, um, the link, but go and work your way through that implicit bias um, quiz and see how you score because I think it's 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 I understand what you're saying about things being patronizing but there's also ways that well I think that ways that maybe we should make a change and I'd be interested in your views about how you might rather than saying no we can't achieve it what would you have to do to achieve that in your particular context mm -hmm. Sorry, that was a long ramble. No, that's very helpful. Somebody there. Yeah. Can I just come back to the, because there was a, a kind of follow-on question just in terms of getting young girls into, into technology. And I, and I think there are certainly some movements around that with tech mums um, and, and, you know, coding for kids and all different types yeah, of activity. Yeah, yeah. Um, going on. And certainly a, a move in the curriculum to make computing more, um, more focused. But I think for me, coming into it at 30 and from being a taxi driver, a bit of a career change. Um, it's not just about, you know, the, the teenagers, but it's also about saying to, the, you know, to society as general, it's never too late to retrain. You've probably got a skill set that's going to be really helpful. So, you know, make a sideways shift instead of a, you know, a decision at that stage. I'd love to see this conversation again in, in footy, 2034 because <laughs> by then all of all of because I've got friends who have daughters who are you know using their tablets and they're improving their IT skills without even realizing mm -hmm. and it's going to take that amount of time I think for those young kids to trickle up and, and come come up through the ranks Frank was there a, a question yeah ready to go uh, Sharon Penfold I'm a contract IT project and program manager in higher education um, I think there's a very simple sounding solution which has only occurred to me this year, and that's after 28 years of being in technology against the odds, without the pu pure pedigree that the BCS have always insisted on. Mm. And I was lucky enough last year to recruit a very gifted business analyst. I wanted them so much, I agreed to flexible working um, to quite an extreme. The quality of their work was the best um, I've ever seen delivered. She had only wanted, she had only wanted a six-month role, 
when it came time to recruit, it occurred to me I needed to think more creatively about where I sourced people from. I needed to look for people in particular who were happy with flexible working. There's an implication there that you are tapping into a pool of very gifted women. I have found a superb agency, which I will name check if you don't mind. It will make the women smile, Capability Jane. And they do represent an equally gifted pool of men who want the flexible working. So for people recruiting, actually look beyond the easy um, process that you will have embedded in your organisation. Actively work. look for flexible working. I already provide that. Yeah. So, and I think universities, that was the other question I asked IT directors, the female IT directors, was, was higher education better or worse to work in? And, well, interestingly enough, most of them said it was better if they'd come from outside mm -hmm. into a, you know, outside banking or whatever, because of the flexibility. Mm -hmm. There's a perceived um, flexibility yeah. that you should expect to get. But I know I, I have friends who work in the HG sector who've really struggled with their line managers to let them yeah. compress the hours or, you know, flexible, flexible working. Hours. So I think um, there's something that a much more senior, maybe HR level, has got well, to be done. Well, institutional policy-wide, yeah. I think. Policy-wide. Yeah. Um, yeah, are there any questions or contributions? Lady Hello. down at the front, Maureen. I Hello. don't know if there is a microphone. Oh, the man at the front. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I was just reflecting on our conversation in the context of education and, and women in educational technology. And um, I, I have a senior role in educational technology, and um, there are, I think, a, a real lack of women, not, uh, not necessarily just in institutions, but I think we should think a bit about you know, the funding councils, the regulators. Um, quite a few organizations come to mind where I think um, that that problem continues. And um, in, in terms of career progression, if we look at you know, senior levels where, where IT directors move on next, I think that's even worse for, for, for women having a career progression. And I think I completely agree with James that you know, that, that isn't restricted to, to tech and IT and in education. Um, anywhere that is the same, um, the same problem. But I do think that there is a lot going on to, to really help promote women succeeding in, in senior leadership roles, and, and there is programs both nationally and within institutions to do that. And I don't think there is not a lot more that we could do, but I, I do think that the funding bodies in particular, but also the other government agencies, um, in general, the picture in education, I think, could do a lot more for equality. And one example I can give of a project that, that I've heard about um, is Project Yamana, which was one of the projects from JISC's uh, Summer of Student Innovation. And I don't know if Shree's around anywhere can tell us a bit about that project. Um, but it's certainly it's targeted at young women or girls. Um, an online magazine to launch to, and I think quite a lot of you here probably have already been interviewed. So, um, and, and that has been set up by a, a second year undergraduate. Well, she's second year now, which is, which is good. So Google Project Yamana. Um, any other questions or? There's a few. Yeah. It's very hard to see you all with yes. these lights <laughs> shining in my face. Um, hello. Um, Hi. Having worked in supporting schools in IT for about 15 years, um, I can say that I think it feels like a. Um, having also worked in FE and HE, it feels like a very much a sector issue, um, because 700 schools, the vast majority of people I've worked with have been women. To the point where I went, my vivid memory is going to one school and asking to use the toilet and being pointed to an outdoor brick toilet that was a little kind of cubicle across the far side of the playground because there were no men in the institution. <laughs> so I think actually, although it's slightly different at secondary, within primary, the vast numbers of network managers, technology coordinators, and as to use your looser term, people who use technology are women. I think it changes at secondary. I'm also aware it's easy to blame schools for everything. Because um, it kind of it starts at the root, and that's where that's where that happens. But I, it feels different, I think. And there's I often see headlines about this, that, and the other about schools. I think the reality is quite different. I think one important thing is the change to computing. Actually, may have a negative um, yes. move in, in in what we're discussing here, because ICT is much more about the use, the appropriate use, that kind of broad thing. Whereas computing, and I have to say, somewhat supported by the BCS, is very much about a particular way of looking at technology. 
And it's about coding, the idea that everyone would need to code. And actually, the feeling I get is that within, even within schools, there's a kind of, this is quite technical, therefore we give it to, we're looking for a man, we're looking for a man. And actually, that kind of narrowing of the agenda and narrowing of the curriculum in some ways will have an impact on this. But I think the status quo in primary, and um, I know it's, this is more anecdata, I know, but um, the status quo in that is, is very much, it's women. And that's what children are seeing when they grow up. They're seeing women using technology. There comes a point when that changes. Mm. It may be at the end of school. You can inform me better than that, but it's, it's definitely not a universal thing. Is there, is there something that we can be doing, therefore, in HE, like working with um, teenagers or women who are uh, female students who are about to launch into a career? So something to like the careers agenda. Could, could your company go to we some do. schools? We do. We, well, <laughs> well, it's going in, and we, we, talk, we talk about cybersecurity a lot. We educate parents and kids on that because it's so important. Um, but we've got really close ties with um, Bucks UTC. Uh, and we're helping them at the moment work on one of their foundation degrees in um, cybersecurity. We had some girls in recently. Um, they've got 100 kids on a course they're doing at the moment. Three of them are girls. Three. So I'm gonna, can yeah. I raise something controversial? And you can all shoot me if you like. Okay. So does anybody think that actually there is a difference between men and women in terms of the subjects they prefer and the things they like to do? Because it seems so polarized and stark, some of this, that there are so, and I, I hate, I've, I've got three boys, and I have tried to bring them up in a very gender neutral way, and it has made not the slightest bit of difference. <laughs> they shoot each other, they write with each other, they play computer games, and that is what they do. And I have really questioned this myself as to whether this is nurture and nature, or whether, well, which, which has the most influence? So I'm being very controversial there. We can make it less controversial <laughs> and talk about it as traits, because there are traits, definitely okay. feminine, masculine traits, and, and the, the, the feminists okay. would say it's the patriarchal Full stereotype. stereotype. Um, <laughs> yeah, GCSE, it was like 44%, I think, of um, kids that take IT-type GCSEs are, are girls. Um, and they did really well as well. I think they were higher ATCs than the guys did. And then it, when it gets to A-level, it drops like mm. a stone. Because it's, isn't the GCSE syllabus about how you use Word, how you use PowerPoint, yeah. how you use some software, and then the A-level syllabus yeah. gets a bit more gritty in terms of its technical yeah. content? And yeah, I mean, they do, I don't know where they're going, but they're, it's certainly not appealing. There's, some, there's a, it's a huge difference, like you say, between the GCSE and the A-level, where girls are just saying, that's not for me. Mm. There's a question in the front there from Lindsay. <laughs> Yeah, so um, drawing on all this, there, I mean, the whole area of sex roles research is very well established. I mean, there's a whole journal called the Sex Roles Journal. Um, so, you know, you might want to check that out if you're interested. Um, and, and, you know, like Sarah says, there are, um, you know, the established way of talking about this in the hard sciences um, is, is about masculine traits and feminine traits. And, and generally, men tend to have more of the masculine traits. An interesting thing is that over time, um, people have found in the last few decades that women are becoming more masculine. Um, so that's a very interesting... So not the other way around? Not the other way around at all. So men, men aren't becoming more feminine, uh, but women are becoming more masculine. So that's one question I'd perhaps like to ask the panel, um, you know, whether they think that in order to address this balance, um, and, and I think no one's kind of really got down to why we should address this imbalance, um, but, which is an interesting question. I'm not saying we shouldn't. Um, but so is it that we need to actually uh, become more masculine, even more masculine? Obviously, we're in flux. We're becoming more masculine. Is it that we need to become more masculine? Or is it that our systems and our, our hierarchies, our organizations need to become more feminine? I'm also really interested in the question that we've just got onto about, you know, whether women actually like the kind of the computing and the coding. And I'd like to ask you, you know, do you do coding? Did you ever get into it? Did you ever fancy getting into it? Um, so those are loads of questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm happy to come in on that one. I think I'll answer the last one first. I learned to code in Pascal. I hated every minute of it. I did it as part of my, my college course. And then I did Visual Basic, I think, as part of my degree. And I'm happy that I understand the logic behind that and that if I needed to ever code, I would be able to. But my preference is I'm, I'm much more of a strategic person, so I like to do the bigger picture rather than the detail. The first question um, about the masculinity I find really interesting, particularly working at a high level in my organisation, there is still, and I'll, I'm only talking about my organisation, there is still this old boys club 
of you know boardrooms where there's a you know a lot of male presence and a lot of the attributes that you need to get on in that environment are masculine so you've got to be quite aggressive sometimes you've got to be very assertive which is you know f from a woman's point of view necessarily you might wait for someone to ask your opinion but in these situations you can't do that you've got to if you want to get on and be seen to be bossy or ambitious or any of those terms that girls are called but boys aren't, then you, you have to um, understand those traits and choose when to apply them. And I think I was at a, a, a Gartner conference a while back where the VP of research talked about the, you know, the wolf as the CIO and how you might work in an organisation where you take, um, you're a light-sided person, so you want to be transparent and honest and all of those things, but the organisation might be quite dark and Machiavellian and you have to choose which ones you want to apply at what point. And I think that's something I don't think women are taught. I think that men might get that instinctively, and I might be wrong, but I think women, are, women have to learn that behaviour. On the flip side then, you get the, oh, the emotional woman. Yes. Oh, she's being emotional. Yeah. You need to be more cold like a man. Yeah. And I don't think that's necessarily true. Yeah, men can be emotional. I've had some great rows in the office with emotional men. Um, <laughs> Obviously, we all get on fine. But it can come up, I think, sometimes. Is you know, oh, you, you're being emotional. This isn't helping. Mm -hmm. um, but emotional intelligence, I think, can bring a lot to an organisation. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something generally, I'm generalising, that you know, yeah. we tend to be good at. A passion. Mm -hmm. I'm Sorry. thinking also about politics as well. And, and, and in my preparation with my page of stats, that um, in total, we've got 647 MPs. 500 men and 147 female and so it's the same thing that it's perceived that the women in the house of the parliament have got to shout and be aggressive and assertive but actually maybe um if the men or those with the masculine traits could be a bit more moving over to our side of the spectrum that you no know, the world would be a, a happier friendlier place um <laughs> can i ask the audience a yeah. question because i'm i'm really interested in the same way that heidi when frank talked to us initially about doing this panel and heidi and i were a bit like mm, do we really have to? <laughs> um, only I, if there's vodka. Only if there's vodka, right. yeah. Um, I'm interested to know, uh, from the audience's perspective, if anyone's really fed up with this whole women in technology thing. And I'm not asking you to do a <laughs> raise of either. hands, but you can come and talk to me afterwards. But for, for me, as, as with Heidi, I'm a woman in technology and I'm kind of getting on with it. And I'll do what I can to help anybody else. But I almost get a little bit bored with this because, you know, we're getting on and we're doing it. Yes, there is a whole load of people and I'm sure we can, we can do some helpful things. But if anyone wants to comment on that, I'd be very interested. Somebody there, just loads of people. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> We've got two minutes. So if we could take a couple of points from each of um, our people in the corner there. Just before I pass on to my colleague here, I just wanted to say, yeah, I was really bored with it, but you four have inspired my interest, in, uh, <laughs> and now I quite want to find out a bit more. <laughs> Fab. Um, uh, I'm Amber. I work at the University of Warwick. I think I've been looking at what people have been tweeting about, and I think there's some people saying, hang on a minute, is there a problem in e-learning, technology-enhanced learning? And I don't think there is. Is there a problem in IT services in universities and, and some big organisations? Yes, I think there is. And I think it comes down to something to do with there being a, a different business culture around it, exactly the things that you were talking about, about needing to have a front, needing to be authoritative, and all those gender things come into play. But what's interesting, I think, is that as e-learning matures and becomes much more of an institutional commitment and much more of a solid part of the institution anyway, yeah. we kind of shouldn't give too much ground and all pretend to be the IT services culture because we actually need to import that yeah. culture of um, thinking about users, thinking about workflows. The things which are a bit softer about e-learning actually need to come into mm -hmm. IT services and institutions. I think that's a very good point. I, yeah. think, I think it worries me, so the lady who said about the traits that women are becoming more masculine. I think that's a very interesting uh, finding that, you know, I think that what women have done to get on is become, and I, I have to say, it worries me when you've been saying all of these things, that as I am in a leadership position, I must have adopted all these <laughs> bloody traits. Maybe I'm just naturally like that. Um, <laughs> I don't know, but it is, I think you're right. I think that there is, it would be better if we didn't have to have this debate at all. You know, I think it would be better if we were, we took 
the relative strengths of each gender and made that work without one set of traits having to be more important to get on. So absolutely. We actually have a bit more time Ooh. than we were allowed. So can I take a, <laughs> a, a, take a question at the front? Um, just a question, really. If you look at the bottom, that last um, comment about the 35% higher ROE mm. with women, Maybe it'd be interesting to find out whether there was any cultural change or cultural difference in those boards between the masculine and feminine traits. So whether there is evidence that actually those that are successful have done so by promoting maybe the more female traits or not. So is it the case that the world of business hasn't changed and the women who are going into it are becoming masculine? Yeah. In other words, or is it that the world of business has been changing and those feminine traits are actually required rather than just needs to be promoted. And I think some of that research would have come from the financial sector in the last few yeah. years. And I think there is evidence there. Be good to know. Point. Yeah. There's a microphone somewhere at the back. Yep. If you've got a microphone, speak. Can you put your hand up properly? There's some hands up at the back. <laughs> hands up over it. Hands up over Yeah, OK, so here we go. The microphone's coming at the front. Hi, Nick Clark, um, IT consultant. Um, the best IT manager I ever worked with was a woman. Um, she knew how to get the best out of her technical team. Um, she claimed she didn't have technical skills. She was wrong. Um, but when it came to looking at the next level up, the IT director role, she ruled herself out because she had the perception that it would require deep technical knowledge. So I think that's probably used to be the case, but it's less the case now. We need to change that perception that it, what's needed is strategic overview and that side of skills, not the deep technical, because you can pick that up from the technicians that you're managing. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's this change in the concept of what a leader is to be in an IT role. And I think that a lot of it is around people management, strategy setting, um, not about whether you know how to program in .NET or Java or whatever it is. Absolutely. In, a, in addition to that, though, my, my concern is that one of the institutions I work for, 65% of the workforce are female, which is great, but the majority of those women are in grades 1 to 6, and those on 7 to 9 are mainly men. So there's still something around the flexibility we were talking about and policies in place for you know, enabling. And I, I talked to the HR manager and said, well, why is that? And one of the things he came up with was about career breaks and women who are taking career breaks to have families feeling that they're, they've lost time and you know, those five or six years that they've been out of off work, they're not going to catch up. So that's something, again, that institutions should be addressing. And society is general, because if you think about, you know, women in technology and, the, and child care and all of the military arrangements mm -hmm. that uh, mums and dads that we have to put in place in order to get into the office in the first place, then that all has to help us do that and not, yeah. not get in the way of it, almost. I think we had a question here. Hi, yeah. uh, Ros Bell from Manchester Uni. Um, I think it's really great that a lot of people are having positive experiences of women in tech. But it's important to remember that um, there are a lot of women, especially in gaming, that are facing adversity. There's been a lot of um, news reports about women facing a lot of um, bullying on social media in the gaming industry. So whilst it might be brilliant in e-learning, um, it's not great everywhere else. So it's important to remember that. Mm. Thank you. Frank, was there another question? Can, can I actually back? ask you a question? Yes. Am I allowed to? I'm just Go on then, Frank. Um, you, you guys talked about um, sort of uh, stereotyp. Patriarchal stereotypical general. Um, so, so, my, no, no. so my question, my question is this: um, uh, I think uh, it was in relation to, uh, I think it was Beyonce being called bossy or something. And the and the whole argument is that if if I, as a man, am quite you know do this, do this, just get on with it, as I'm authoritative and it's good and you know I'm I'm getting things done. If one of you are that, then you're called bossy, and I don't. I don't yeah, really get that. Bitch. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I didn't, uh, you know. Yeah, I've been called ruthless. <laughs> and I don't know yeah. whether anyone in the room knows me personally, but I, I would never describe myself as ruthless. I've been called an authoritarian <laughs> as well. Yeah. Did you guys see Emma Watson's speech she did at the, um, the UN the other day? She spoke very passionately about feminism. Yeah, that should be lined up with the lovely people at Footy who are mm -hmm. tweeting. Mm -hmm. I sent them that link, so that's, that's a really good one Fabulous. to look at. Yeah. 
There's one at the back. Oh, He's been waiting for ages. Yes. Hi. Hi. Yes. Hi, I'm uh, Brian from the Mobile Collective. We do hack days. And this last year, we've been uh, starting to do them in secondary schools. Mm -hmm. And what I can tell you is most of the people who come to these hack days and science clubs are girls. Okay. And they're also the overachievers. They're really excited by it. Mm -hmm. Now, contrast that to what I did in my last job. I taught at uh, Imperial College in the computer science department. It's mainly undergraduates are mainly male. So whatever happens, happens uh, in A-levels and applying to yeah. university. Uh, and it's a catastrophe, though, because it, it's very clear from the excitement uh, and interest that the girls show that they can do this. And at the back there, I know this gentleman's been waiting for a while, Frank. I uh, just want to go back to a point about saying, you know, you're saying you're bored of the this, you're, that we should, why are we talking about it and things. I think just following on from the, the, the point made about the gaming is if you look at the way that some women in tech are bullied, harassed, online, trolled, whatever you want to say, we have a problem in society. Yeah. Yeah. We need to address that problem. Yeah. Yeah. And if this helps, then great in yeah. terms of doing it. And if people are bored, just go and talk to those people who've been harassed and bullied. Well, yeah. And I think that's where I started saying, you know, I didn't think there was a problem. I know loads of women who, but actually when you look at the figures mm. and you look at some of the experiences, there is obviously something going on here that we need to look at and try and fix. I totally agree. Mm. Thank you. Yep, my name is Rafi Joshi. Um, whether we take the 11% or the 18%, we can see that there's a stark issue in, in, in the statistics. And I'm not pretending I've got any magic bullets to that. But I do have a question, which is that if we close that leadership gap without addressing the gaps in the non-leadership roles, is that really what we're aiming for? And even if we got there, isn't it going to lead to uh, claims of positive biases? Thank you. There's a question there. Is it Bryony? I can't see with the lights. Hello. <laughs> Someone with a microphone there, do you want to go ahead? If you've got a microphone, yeah. speak. And then we'll I was just going to say, Amina from the University of Salford, I think it's a sort of wider issue. Um, it's women as experts in general. And I know the BBC recently have had a huge drive on increasing the number of women experts that appear on television. Mm -hmm. So in terms of um, role models for young girls, yeah. and just generally seeing women as being experts, I think it's women seeing themselves as experts. Often they put themselves down and sort of, even when they are experts, don't give themselves the credit for being that. Yeah. And the BBC doing something like that, yeah. I've yeah. noticed it. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. a concerted yeah. effort, and it's what's needed at this time for yeah. perception in society to start to change in that direction. The media is very powerful in this whole yeah. thing. And, and when you picked up the photos of all the women, mm -hmm. it occurred to me, we don't see those pictures of the women, but the Steve Jobs and yeah. Bill Gates, you know, are special. Marissa Mayer made the cover of Vogue. But then she's not ugly, mm. it's also fair to say. Now, yes. had she not been as attractive, would yeah. she have made the cover of Vogue? And with, and with the, um, the Emma, Emma Watson speech, when you looked at the publicity around that, particularly the Daily Mail, which you know, it was look at the dress that she's wearing. Let's not listen to what she's saying, saying about a really important topic. And I think there is maybe some, um, you know, some reticence in women putting themselves forward for panels like this or in the media generally, because we know we'll get judged on what we're wearing and, and you know. I'm not know, even judging <laughs> I'm not looking at Twitter, that maybe is, is the, the feminist trait of mine. I, I'm too scared to, but I'm sure others don't care. Uh, sorry, Bryony. Um, I was just going to say, obviously, there's gender discrimination and a lot of different types of discrimination in society. Um, I don't think we can sort out that problem today. Um, but from my point of view, there's a lot of talk about how many, you know, how many women are in these IT roles. Have we actually asked the people who aren't in these IT roles if they'd want to be? Mm. Because surely women, I know this is controversial, surely women have a choice. Yeah. You know, they can choose whether or yeah. not they want to be in IT roles. Yeah. You can choose which job you want to apply yeah. for, you can choose which degree you want to take, which courses you want to take in education. So that's, you could talk about the percentages that are or aren't in IT, yeah. but if women don't want to be in IT, then why are we trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist? Yeah. And what I would have loved to have seen today, I mean, there's four of you up there, we've just spent about an hour. I would have loved to see the four of you talk about the future of technology and education and 
to be role models for the women and the men in this room, rather than sitting there talking about a problem that may or may not exist because we haven't actually got the data that we need to answer the problem, if there is one. Just an observation that in, in my time spent dealing with people in IT and technology, um, the only people who I've ever met in positions of responsibility who, I don't know if I can say bullshit on a microphone, were men. I've never met a woman in a position of authority and responsibility with technology who was able to do that because she was clearly, because she would have been told, you know, she had to be up her game. Now that's not necessarily a good thing. She's being judged probably to a higher standard. But the only people I look back on and think, God, he was rubbish, were actually men. And you know, yet still managed to hold a position of responsibility. I don't know what that says. I've also got a question about um, the role of, if you're familiar with Lottie Dexter when she did the Year of Code, and she went on news nights, and Jeremy Paxman was, I think it was Paxman, was fairly incisive and judging her on whether she could code or not. And is that a case of her being judged to a standard that a man going on there wouldn't have been asked that, do you think? And I'd like to hear what you say on that. But on the other hand, why shouldn't she be able to code? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But if I'm out of the line, if I'm not going to code, it probably wouldn't have been an issue. It wouldn't have um, been a question. Down yeah. the fallout of what's a woman doing running this? Yeah. They should, yeah. Exactly. Any other questions? Put your hands right up straight so I can see. Oh, yeah. well, um, we've got a couple, about a minute, I think. OK, well, I think we will leave it there then. But I just want to say, uh, to wrap up, 30% of this audience is female, but equality is everyone's problem. So you know, I think we've set, set uh, the bar, and we've set an interesting topic for discussion. And keep tweeting. I probably still won't look. Um, <laughs> I hope you found this session thought-provoking, useful, even enlightening. Um, I hope that it will lead you to question what's going on in your own institutions, um, regardless of your gender. So thank you, and thank you to the wonderful panel. Thank you.